I'm Gareth Barlow, and in the early hours of Monday, the 28th of August, these are our main stories. Russian officials say genetic tests have confirmed that the Wagner mercenary boss, Yevgeny Prigozhin, was killed in a plane crash earlier this week. There are indications that Ukrainian forces have broken through key Russian defensive positions in the south of the country. And the main opposition leader in Zimbabwe has accused Emerson Mnangagwa of carrying out a coup after official results show the president won Wednesday's election. Also in the podcast... It was a small protest because Hallstatt is a small place and these were locals, but for a long time now they have felt that there is simply too much tourism in Hallstatt. Residents of an alpine town in Austria, known as one of the most Instagram places in the world, are fighting back against mass tourism. It's been confirmed that Yevgeny Prigozhin, the chief of the Wagner mercenary group, died when his plane crashed on Wednesday. On Sunday, Russian investigators said they'd identified all the victims. The plane, a private jet, crashed northwest of Moscow on the 23rd of August, killing all those on board. It's still not known why the plane came down. Our Russia editor, Steve Rosenberg, reports. The statement was brief, just three sentences. It didn't even mention the Wagner chief by name. But the implication was clear. Here were the Russian authorities apparently confirming the death of Yevgeny Prigozhin. A spokesperson for Russia's investigative committee announced that genetic testing of bodies recovered from the crash site had been completed and that the identities of all ten victims matched the names on the flight manifest. That list of passengers and crew included Mr Prigozhin, and his right-hand man, Wagner commander Dmitry Utkin. The private jet on which they'd been travelling had crashed into a field 60 miles north of Moscow on Wednesday. The cause of the crash is still unclear. There's been much speculation about a bomb, a missile, some kind of sabotage. The Kremlin has denied having anything to do with it. But that denial has not removed the suspicion that Mr. Prigozhin was targeted by the Russian authorities as an act of revenge for the mutiny he'd organised in June. The insurrection by Wagner fighters, an unprecedented challenge to the authority of President Putin. Evgeny Prigozhin led a life packed with incident and controversy. With more, here's Danny Eberhard. Evgeny Prigozhin's rise to prominence reads like a novel. In Soviet times, a young Prigozhin served a lengthy jail term for assault and robbery. On his release, he sold hot dogs before setting up restaurants and making contacts with another St. Petersburg native, Vladimir Putin. He built a fortune on lucrative state catering contracts, gaining the nickname Putin Chef. But it was as the head of the Wagner paramilitary group he'll be remembered. He co-founded it in 2014 during Russia's partly proxy military intervention in eastern Ukraine. The group expanded operations to Syria and Africa, picking up a reputation for propping up authoritarian regimes and carrying out grave human rights abuses. Since last year, Wagner's fought in some of the bloodiest battles in Ukraine, including Bakhmut. Disillusioned, Prigozhin bitterly denounced Russia's military establishment. The dispute spiralled into a full-scale mutiny. President Putin called it treasonous. Two months on, a man who had no qualms embracing brutality has met his own violent end. Many suspect it's the Kremlin's revenge. That was Danny Eberhardt. Meanwhile, reports from southern Ukraine suggest the country's armed forces have broken through some of Russia's key defensive positions. Our diplomatic correspondent Paul Adams is monitoring developments from Kyiv. Ukraine's offensive in the south has been slow going, but after three months of tough fighting southeast of Zaporizhia, some Ukrainian units do finally appear to have broken through Russia's formidable first line of defence. As usual, the government here in Kiev is saying very little about how its forces are getting on, but this could mark a significant moment. Russia's defences have so far been well organised, but Moscow's forces have been under enormous pressure for months now. It's not known how strong their remaining defensive lines are or how they'll respond to the latest developments. 
Let's head north now to the Baltics and the leader once called Europe's new Iron Lady. But the Prime Minister of Estonia is currently having her tough credentials sorely tested. Kai Kallis has taken a particularly tough line when it comes to Russia, just over the border. She's a strident backer of Ukraine and a staunch critic of Moscow's invasion. Indeed, she told Estonian businesses they ought to withdraw from Russia. And that's now what's got her into trouble. I asked our Europe regional editor, Paul Moss, why exactly Kai Kallis is in the news. Because it turns out that her husband had 25% shares in a company involved in logistics and that company was sending supplies to an aerosol company inside Russia. Now, we're not talking huge money, but the company is said to have earned the equivalent of nearly $1.5 million since Russia invaded. And that is seriously embarrassing. Last year, you know, Kaya Kallis said that the state railway company in Estonia shouldn't carry nickel to Russia. Now, nickel's not subject to sanctions. Her point was that it was wrong to do anything that helped keep Russia's economy going. And that obviously leaves her open to accusations of serious hypocrisy. She says she didn't know about these investments. She says he and she and her husband just don't discuss business at home. Now, on the one hand, that's understandable. I guess if he spent his day disguised, you know, trying to work out which kind of widget to put the company's money in, it might not really come up around the dinner table. If your wife is the prime minister of Estonia, she's been criticising anyone doing business with Russia, and you've got shares in a company that's doing that... You know what people are saying? That might just come up somewhere between dessert and sitting down to watch the television for the evening. This is serious trouble for her. You would think so, to some degree, surely. And and on that basis then, you mentioned serious trouble. What has the reaction been? It has been very angry. Political opponents are circling. They're talking about having a motion of no confidence tabled in the Estonian parliament this week. The media are hostile. Lots of newspapers calling for her to go. And perhaps worse, there are surveys which suggest the majority of Estonians want her to resign. You've got to understand, this is a very small country right next to Russia, this huge neighbour. In fact, Estonia was once absorbed into Russia as part of the Soviet Union. Anything to do with Russia is very, very sensitive. Basically, if you're an Estonian politician, you would probably be better off being discovered to have stolen money from an orphanage or perhaps having an affair with the finance minister's husband. Any of that would be better than something which involves Russian money. The thoughts there of Paul Moss. Well, the BBC's Tim Frank spoke to a leading critic of the Estonian Prime Minister. He's Ermas Reinsalu, a former Minister of Foreign Affairs and chairman of the centre-right opposition. This is a a question of of moral, of personal integrity of Prime Minister. And in that context, media, opposition have called, and I I fully believe that uh, Prime Minister has has out of uh, moral capacity in this domain uh, to continue this policy of advocating harsh sanctions uh, and uh, to continue in in her office. But I wonder if one of the key parts of what you've just said is the fact that it's the Prime Minister's husband. It's not the Prime Minister herself. It's not her company. I mean, why should she be responsible for what her husband gets up to? And and also, from what I understand, he and his company that he's been involved in this logistics operation, they haven't broken any laws. Yes, but uh, this is uh, the key issue. Estonian demand is that there is also a moral approach to companies, to countries, that we should ban all the uh, trade towards Russia. And Prime Minister herself has uh, put it uh, in public messages very clear and steadfast. When it became public, Prime Minister's uh, comment on this particular business of her husband, unfortunately, has been a supportive one. During all these 500 days of war, there has been a systematic logistics uh, to transport uh, the raw materials into Russia to deliver this company. And uh, unfortunately, this company still goes on and the uh, cargo deliveries uh, continue. Ermas Reinsalu, a former Minister of Foreign Affairs in Estonia. Well, on Friday, the husband of the Estonian Prime Minister apologised for the situation that's arisen and the, quote, harm caused to my wife. Arve Halik said he would immediately sell his shares in the Stark Logistics Company and withdraw from it.
Let's take you to Zimbabwe now, and Emerson Mnangagwa is beginning another five-year term as the country's president, which international observers and the opposition say was secured by intimidating voters and widespread electoral fraud. President Mnangagwa won with almost 56% of the vote, a result the opposition leader, Nelson Chamisa, described as blatant and gigantic fraud. Unsurprisingly, the ruling ZANU-PF party rejected the criticism, saying the vote was fair and peaceful. Ziambi Ziambi is Zimbabwe's Minister of Justice. In the history of this country, this is one election that was extremely peaceful. And our processes, the way they were done, they were very fair. Nobody was intimidated. Everyone was afforded the same opportunities to do whatever they wanted to do. And I'm not very sure which areas the allegations are coming from to say that uh, they were not fair. Well, even before the results were announced, several independent foreign observer missions criticised the fairness and credibility of the elections. Observer missions from the EU, Commonwealth and 16-nation Southern African Development Community reported a number of concerns with the vote, including the banning of opposition rallies. Among the critics is the Zimbabwean journalist and documentary maker Hopo Chanono. In urban areas which are mainly opposition strongholds, they didn't have election material, that is ballot papers, for over 12 hours. And this was a form of rigging called voter suppression. Prior to the election day itself, the opposition was not allowed to hold all its rallies. They have to get permission from the police. So everything was stacked against the opposition well, the ruling Zani PF party was also declared the winner in the parliamentary race, but failed to secure a two-thirds majority to allow the party to institute constitutional amendments, which observers had feared could be used to extend presidential term limits. So what now then for the main opposition party, Citizens Coalition for Change? What are their options? A question for our correspondent in Harare, Shingai Nyoka. Nelson Chamisa, the opposition leader, held a press conference. He kept the cards very close to his chest, uh, but really uh, reasserted the position that he believes that he won this presidential election. Officially, he polled 44% of the votes and Emerson Mnangwa got 526 But he really wasn't clear about what he was going to do next. Um, I specifically asked him whether he was going to take the matter to court, um, and he didn't respond. That's because in the past, when he has taken taken these matters to court. He tried to get the 2018 results overturned in the constitutional court and he failed. So he really is running out of options. There has been talk about protests, but we really haven't seen that on the ground, that level of anger that would lead to protests. It strikes me that Zimbabwe needs a smooth electoral process because the country still faces huge economic challenges. It's shunned by wide parts of the international community too. It, it doesn't need these kind of distractions. And that is the concern that was expressed by Nelson Chamisa is that for so many decades, for almost as many decades as I've worked as a journalist in this country, every election has been disputed, it's been violent, and there's a link that people make here between the Zimbabwe's politics and the state of its economy. It has been shunned by the Western countries, investors have fled. They also, under, under former President Robert Mugabe, where the policies were so inconsistent and they would, would change, uh, investors really didn't want to come back. And so really this election was to have been the first sign of confidence uh, to investors that Zimbabwe is really ready to fix its politics, to adhere to human rights as well as to the rule of law. Uh, but that hasn't happened. Uh, the Commonwealth, for example, Zimbabwe had, had applied to be readmitted to the Commonwealth and uh, one of the conditions was a free and fair election. So given the damning assessment that the Commonwealth gave of these elections, it's not clear whether that will happen. And so it seems that Zimbabwe is just stuck in this endless crisis of of politics and bad politics and and bad economics. The voice there is Shinga Nyoka. Since it was launched in 2016, use of the video sharing platform TikTok has grown exponentially. For a billion users every month, those are the company's figures, it's a major source of both entertainment and information. At this year's Edinburgh Fringe Festival in Scotland, young TikTok stars have been trying to translate their online fame into performing comedy live on stage. Vincent Dowd reports. 
Here in Edinburgh, there are well over 3,000 shows, and comedy dominates, such as Knock Knock, whose young cast will mean nothing to you unless you're an online devotee of TikTok, in which case they are massive. Guys, I'm at a wedding, right? And uh, I want to get married. I'm going to propose. Someone stole my mince beef when it fell out my bag on this little walk back from the co-op, which is only 200 metres away. Oh, Molly and Zach voted for Mitch and Ella. Mitch winked at him. We will be learning about World War II, actually, for the rest of your school careers, actually. Comedy burnout can hit on the Edinburgh fringe, but this audience was thrilled to see four TikTok favourites in the flesh. Like his colleagues Stephen McKell, Ayame Ponder and Coco Sorrell, in his mid-twenties, Henry Rowley has an impressive online following. His act sends up his own middle-class laddishness. <laughs> right, so we're at Fringe, right? We're halfway through. And it's sick, right? Everyone seems to get really competitive about how niche they can be with the shows that they've seen, right? <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm there, strolling out of the Lady Boys of Bangkok for the <laughs> Hi, I'm Henry Rowley. Hey, Arme. I am Stephen McKell, and I'm from Faith. I am Sorel. My online handle is Coco Sorel. What would I kind of associate you with? Reaction videos, so reacting to anything from bottles smashing on stairs to, <laughs> to men and women, actually, inclusive. Posh stereotypes are the most famous ones, but also uncomfortable things like creepy teachers. For my Love Island debriefs, where I just talk about the show Love Island. Comedy sketches, more around about Scottish culture and growing up being Scottish. I think I'd lost the dream about becoming someone. I'd always been an attention seeker. I was an estate agent and I'd posted one video that did really well and I thought, oh wow, I can make it out of this dump. Online is so saturated with so much good content. You can get lucky when something picks up a wave and takes off. And when you get that, you get eyes on your other stuff. Once you get a video that does well, like how are you going to do it after that? This is a world which is being invented as we speak. What do you hope to move on to? Acting, presenting, hosting, comedy, writing. I'm Edward Lindemann. I head up uh, entertainment and news operations at TikTok here in the UK. TikTok is really synonymous with comedy content you know the, the very early stages of the platform people would come to TikTok because they made them laugh and I think when TikTok became really well known was during the pandemic we all really needed some of that that light relief and some of that comedy content. Greta Teitelman from Los Angeles has a high energy show almost next door to the TikTok stars but she's slightly older and she's ambivalent about TikTok's emerging power to shape bite-sized comedy content. I think TikTok is a really, really, really amazing tool and I oscillate between feeling like a big fool for not investing more of my time in it, but then I also feel an immense freedom in the fact that, well, I don't have you know, millions of followers that I constantly need to be feeding their hunger for more content. I can honestly be intimidated by some content creators on TikTok just in the sheer volume that they can put something out and the fearlessness that they seem to have. Some TikTok comedy success stories have already been catching the eye of TV and radio, even of film companies. TikTok's critics said the talent it discovered wouldn't last. Ed Lindemann of TikTok does not agree. The creators we see succeeding and probably the two key attributes that they have is one being creative and that sounds very obvious but it's really about coming up with new and different ideas around whether it's characters or videos themselves and then the second one actually is consistency it's a, a big commitment it's a full-time job so they're constantly thinking about the next piece of uh, content or video that they're creating and that's because they want to to really engage the communities that follow them and provide them with with things that make them laugh Ed Lindemann of TikTok, ending that report by Vincent Dowd. Still to come. We brought this bag with us. Look at the holes. Look at the holes. It wasn't down for very long. Hear why officials in Rome are having to clean up the Colosseum.
from their battles on the world stage. I gave everything for that race and I was able to come away with something that like I've dreamed about since I was a kid. To their battles behind closed doors. I had to reach some terrible bottoms in my addiction and suffer some really terrible consequences and suffer a lot of loss due to my drinking to get to where I am today. On the Podium is the podcast where Olympians and Paralympians share their stories. On the Podium from the BBC World Service. Find it wherever you get your BBC podcasts. Welcome back to the Global News Podcast. Let's take you to Argentina, where officials say there's been a wave of looting over the past week, with attacks on shops and supermarkets in several provinces. A government spokesperson accused the libertarian opposition leader, Javier Millet, of stoking the unrest. He's currently the front-runner as October's election draws closer. He's denied the claims. Argentina is in the middle of a severe economic crisis, with inflation running into triple figures, putting many basic goods out of the reach of most people. James Menendez spoke to Ana Lankes, Latin American correspondent of The Economist magazine. So how bad has the looting been? The looting started last Friday and carried on throughout the week. And so far, at least 94 people have been detained just in Buenos Aires province. And there were at least 150 separate incidents of looting in the province of Buenos Aires and dozens more across the country. And it's really in cities all across the country. Does it seem in any way organised? So that's what the government is saying. They're saying that Several politicians from opposition parties have stoked the unrest and are encouraging looting on WhatsApp. But so far, we have no proof that any political party is behind this. Rather, it just seems that as fears of uncertainty are mounting and there are fears that there is hyperinflation coming in the next few months, people are getting really nervous. And so there are rumors on WhatsApp that because this crisis is coming, you know, you better stock up soon and loot supermarkets. This has already happened in the past. It happened in 2001 and it happened in 1989 when there were episodes of hyperinflation. And just give us a bit more detail on how bad the economic crisis has become. What is it like for most families? It's really terrible. Right now you have inflation running, annual inflation running at 115%, which is higher than anywhere else in the world except Venezuela, Zimbabwe and Lebanon. And what that means is that the local currency, the peso, devalues so quickly that you cannot save. People do not hold money in local bank accounts. So it's become impossible to save. There is a growing informal economy and people have resorted to bartering. So, for example, now you have markets where you can trade diapers for clothing or, you know, different foodstuffs. So the fear now is that things are going to get worse before they get better, because in order to fix Argentina's economy, the government, whoever comes to power in the October elections, is going to have to make some very difficult decisions. And that's the context in which the looting is happening. And Javier Millet, I mean, he's shaken up the race. Uh, Is he also contributing to the economic uncertainty? Definitely. So as you mentioned, the candidate who got the most votes in the primary was Javier Millet, and he's a libertarian outsider who proposes really radical changes to Argentina's economy, including scrapping the peso and dollarizing the economy and in the process getting rid of the central bank. And the outcome of the primaries added a lot of uncertainty to what is already a very fragile situation. And so the day after the election, the central bank devalued the local currency because of that increased uncertainty. And that will almost certainly lead prices to rise even more in the coming weeks. And then in addition, this year, Argentina was hit by a terrible drought and the country owes a huge debt to the IMF with several payments coming due later this year. So you put all those factors together and there is a lot of fear right now. Anna Lankers of The Economist. Ethiopia and Egypt say talks have resumed in Cairo in an effort to end a lengthy diplomatic row about a huge dam on the River Nile. Egypt and Sudan have long feared that their water supply will be threatened by Ethiopia's decision to build the $5 billion project. Our Africa regional editor, Will Ross, reports. Government officials from Egypt, Ethiopia and Sudan are in Cairo trying to finally come up with an agreement on how to share the waters of the River Nile. Construction of the vast dam in western Ethiopia began more than a decade ago. It started generating electricity early last year and the reservoir is steadily being filled up, much to the anger of Egypt and to a lesser extent Sudan. Almost all of Egypt's water comes from the River Nile, so it sees the dam as a huge threat. Ethiopia says the project is essential in order to electrify millions of homes and help eradicate poverty. 
That report by Will Ross. Let's take you to France and the wooded rolling hills of Meymac. These days, the small town is known for ancient houses, a network of rivers and views of the central French countryside. But back in the Second World War, it was the scene of a mass execution of German prisoners who were forced to dig their own graves and then shot by the French resistance. Archaeologists have been uncovering the site after it was identified by the last surviving witness. Our France correspondent, Hugh Schofield, picks up the story. This comes about because the 98-year-old Edmond Réveil has decided at the uh, very end of his life to reveal this extraordinary secret, which was the killing by the resistance, French resistance, of 40, 50, the numbers are not entirely clear, German prisoners just after D-Day. And this was a couple of days, like you say, after D-Day, in this kind of wooded area, this network of rolling hills yeah. and rivers around there, yeah. and, and these Germans were forced to, to dig their own graves before they were then shot. The circumstances are very specific. It, it was after D-Day. It was at the time of great tension across France as German forces pushed up to Normandy. The days immediately preceding this had been terrible German exactions in the area. 99 people hanged publicly in the town of Tulle, uh, where these German prisoners w- were taken, and then the, the, the massacre of, of even more people at Orodeau sur Glan, the, the village which was just completely destroyed. Um, and that these Germans were being held prisoner because there'd been a little uprising in the town of Toul and Bush had briefly succeeded and this group of 40, 50, 60 German prisoners were marched off into the Maquis, into the wooded sparsely populated um, countryside, not quite mountainous but very, very hilly and the resistance group had no idea what to do with them. They uh, were not trained for this, they hadn't planned for this the circumstances had suddenly changed they radioed through to their command for instructions and for whatever reason, possibly as a reprisal for what had happened in Orodioso Glan and Tulle, the command order came, shoot them so the group uh, ordered the the German soldiers to dig their uh, big trench their own grave and then they were shot in the chest by the French resistance men at a distance of about 4 or 5 metres and tumbled into the into the grave so it's one of those appalling stories one hears about from wartime the oddity is that this time it's the inverted commas goodies who who did it so the archaeologists have found some coins they found some bullets but notably they haven't found any bodies yet what are the yeah. next stages in this search we know roughly where it was and they thought they'd found the trench but they hadn't because this the bit of ground they dug up didn't reveal the bodies but in the, the vicinity of this where they hoped, hoped to find the bodies they had sort of probes down and that was where they found all these artifacts 20 or so bullets and bullet casings coins all dating from pre-1944 the bullet casings and bullets of swiss german american and french manufacture which would reflect exactly the kind of disparate weaponry that irregular resistance would have had so i mean it's quite clear that this is the place Our France correspondent there, Hugh Schofield. You're listening to the Global News Podcast. Now to sport and the World Athletics Championships taking place in Hungary have come to a close. Our sports reporter, Alex Kapstick, is in Budapest. A World Championships full of excitement ended with yet more drama. Mary Mora of Kenya clinched the much-anticipated women's 800 metres, pipping the two favourites, Britain's Keely Hodgkinson and the defending champion Athing Mo of the US. Norway's Jakob Inger Brixton made up for missing out on gold in the 1500 metres with an edge-of-the-seat victory over 5,000. In the finale to nine days of gripping action, Femke Boll, whose fall on the opening day denied the Netherlands gold in the mixed relay, produced a sensational late surge to drag her team into first place in the 4 by 400 metres. On the infield, there was a popular winner in the women's high jump, Yaroslava Machacik, with Ukraine's first gold in Budapest, while in the men's javelin, the Olympic champion from India, Niraj Chopra, threw furthest with Pakistan's Arshad Nadim in the silver medal position. In his closing speech, the head of World Athletics, Sebastian Coe, described the championships as outstanding. Few would argue that Budapest has delivered. Alex Kapstick. In Austria, the residents of an alpine town known as one of the most Instagram places in the world have held a protest against mass tourism. An estimated 10,000 people visit Hallstatt, a world heritage site, every day during the high season. But just 700 people live there. Some of the locals have taken part in a sit-in to block the mountain tunnel which leads to the town. I heard more from the BBC's Bethany Bell in Vienna. 
It was a small protest because Hallstatt is a small place and these were locals, residents, who, people who live there. But for a long time now, they have felt that there is simply too much tourism in Hallstatt, that too many people are coming, particularly too many day trippers. And today, a group of people from Hallstatt went and blocked the mountain tunnel, which is the main route into Hallstatt for these day trippers, many of whom are brought in big travel buses. And uh, they said, really, there has to be a reduction in the number of daily tourists and that they want to have buses not arriving in the place from 5pm until 10am the next day. And to put some figures on this, the village has roughly 700 inhabitants and potentially 10,000 people a day are going during high season. Why has it become so popular?